takes and deep dives. This is Jess, and I am super psyched to be here with the one and only Kim Stoles. You guys absolutely remember her from America's Next Top Model. You're in cycle five, right? Yeah, cycle five in 2005. In 2005. 15 years. <laughs> but you were at that time and like in the in the years following, you really became what we would all refer to as a New York City celesbian. <laughs> that's right. I was um, <laughs> that, you know, I really hate when people put two words together, but that's one of my favorite ones. Um, celesbian. It's that, pretty that amazing. That was me for a short, short period of time. Do you remember or maybe you were even on it when... Kate McKinnon, pre-SNL, Kate McKinnon and Julie Goldman did a series of interviews that they called the Celesbian Specials. They had to have interviewed you. I did not know about this, and I'm so mad I missed it. Oh, yeah. It was when she was on the Big Gay Sketch Show. Wow. Yeah, no, I didn't didn't know that. That's great. I, I wish I'd done it. Are you sure you didn't do it? No, I could have. <laughs> they did a bunch at so, Diner. They did a bunch at Diner. It could have Shore. happened 13 or 14 years ago, and I probably wouldn't remember now, but yeah, it's possible. It's I mean, possible. it seems like something I would do. So, not only were you on America's Next Top Model, which was really how you became, I mean, a household name to, to les- lesbians, to lesbians. <laughs> but you then went on to really put your money where your mouth was and you and your friend created a lesbian bar slash restaurant. That's right, the Dalloway. The Dalloway. If you were on America's Next Top Model in 2005, when did the Dalloway? Uh, much later. So I was on, it was, it was top model in 2005. And then I worked at MTV as a news anchor for four years after that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I got into finance. And it was about three or four years into banking that I opened the Dalloway with Amanda. Um, and so that must have been, I don't know, 2012 or 13, something like that. So this was squarely in the time period of like maybe the L word had like just ended. Like there was this like lesbian renaissance. There was a bit of a lesbian renaissance and also was around the time, you know, the reason we did it was that our favorite lesbian bars in New York City had all closed. I mean, Caddyshack, Click Club, Meow Mix. Um, none of them were in existence anymore. And we just felt like, you know, the ones that existed, I mean, Cubby Hole's its own thing. Henrietta Hudson didn't really garner the kind of crowd that we, you know, we wanted to hang out with necessarily and at the time anyway. And, and so we wanted to bring together, you know, our friends and friends of friends and friends of friends and friends and open up a cool space that could be, you know, lesbian owned, lesbian, like we, I think we only employed lesbians. Um, and you know, most of the clientele of course was gay too. So it was great. It almost had that L word aesthetic. Like it was yeah. chic. It wasn't like grungy the way no. a lot of the other, well, mostly just like all bars in, in the yeah, city have I mean, this. That's like- also why it became very unaffordable. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it was great. Um, it was great. It was, you know, it probably would be still open today if we had just le- left it a bar. But, um, you know, we got a little over our skis and tried to make it a restaurant too. And just the, the margins on food were so difficult that no matter how busy our bar was, the space was so big and two floors that our rent was something like 40 grand a month or whatever it was. It was insane. Holy and shit. we just, you know, we broke even, even with lines around the block. And at some point it just became too cumbersome. Before we get, I want to really dig deep into like how it was. Deep that, dives, if you will. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, I do want to like really drill into like how it was owning this bar and like yeah. how you actually put it together. But let, I, let, I want to get your backstory. So you are a born and bred New Yorker. Yeah, born and raised Manhattan. Where did you go to high school? Burley. Private school. Yeah, private school. And One of those. And where did you grow up? Like what neighborhood were so you So I in? grew up on 84th between Lex and 3rd, uh, Upper East Side. Um, went to Brearley, which was also on the Upper East Side. Um, and actually, our, our apartment was rent stabilized. And so when my parents uh, moved away out of New York um, when I was 18, the lease went into my name. And it's where we still have a house. We still have the apartment today because it's so cheap. We can't, it's like, it makes no sense to get rid of it. You stabilized. have a rent stabilized apartment? Yeah, I mean, I might not after this podcast, I just realized. But I, <laughs> I, I do. We've, we've managed to keep it, which is incredible. I mean, you are one of the lucky ones. Yeah, we're very, very few people. We're, we're one of the one of the last. Holy it's amazing. Shit. Yeah. And you went there all through high school? Yeah. So I went to really K through 12. And then I went to Wesleyan. Oh, you went to Wesley. Oh, so you're very smart. <laughs> I mean, you're in finance. You went to Wellesley. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, it was a good school. Yeah, I liked it. When I want to know, like, when did you come out? And also, like, what was it like? Go. I, you came out when you while you were in high school. Right. Yeah. Towards the end of high school, um, like the very end of high school, uh, I came out, you know, kind of came out to, you know, coming out as a, sometimes a, 
a long process, I guess. But, um, you know, I came back to more family and friends in college as well. And, and then obviously to the whole world in 2005. <laughs> Like, were you out to, like in high school, like to your Yeah, classes? really is like the most progressive. I wouldn't have, I don't think I would have been able to come out, you know, at that age if I went to a different school. I mean, Brearley was, um, it's actually known for um, for having a lot of lesbians. It's such an open-minded um, environment. You know, when I was 13 and 14, I would see girls who were dating, like walking the halls together and holding hands and walking on people kissing the bathroom and stuff like I mean you know it's like it's the kind of place where you know if you're gay you know you're gonna figure it out <laughs> were they experimenting or were they like really gay they were gay yeah I mean, I mean I'm sure some yeah. were you know um I'm sure there was some some experimenting just the way you know people do when they're younger sometimes but um or at any age but um I mean a lot of the girls that um were dating women um are gay and are still out and all of that by the time you were able to like really go out in the city, maybe like like when you were like a senior in high school, or if you were like I don't know if you had a fake ID, but where were <laughs> totally. you? Totally. So like, where are you? I mean, you you just mentioned Meow Mix, yeah, which is an iconic. Yeah, that was awesome spot. That was a really good spot. Um, you know, actually, when I came out, um, my my family wasn't amazing about it, but my school and all my friends were, and um, we a bunch of the gay girls from Brearley would every Tuesday, I want to say, um, every maybe the first Tuesday of every month, Melissa Ferrick, who was like kind of like a gay, a lesbian icon at the oh, time. Yeah. You know, that's okay. Totally. Uh, she had a residency down in the West Village. And so she would play these concerts. Wait, where was her residency? I can't remember. I've been the, the bitter end, maybe. I can't remember. One of those bars down there. And and um, we would all go, like all of us would go every, 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 every month. Um, and it would be like this amazing, remember incredible her, environment. Remember her song Drive? Uh, yeah, I do. Because people would fucking lose their minds to that song and I remember like you know these like really big intense lesbians at the front being like do me Melissa you know it's like fucking crazy but um uh yeah it I I actually learned that song on the guitar (laughs) when I was that age because I was like also obsessed with it but um yeah of course I remember that and that's that song the stranger and there were some good ones but anyway she was a big part of my coming out process actually I love that who who else were you really into Aside from Melissa Ferrick. I really liked Clea Duvall at the time. Of um, course. She was pretty cool. I mean, definitely in terms of like the gay aspect of things, um, you know, we were going to Ani DeFranco and Indigo Girls concerts. And I'm sure Tegan and Sarah, I guess, hadn't started yet, but we're kind of beginning. I, I guess we did get, you know, like Dar Williams. I don't know. <laughs> that, whole, that whole like contingent of lesbian music that was like being played in the halls of Brearley all day long actually like talk about meow mix do you know how i found out about meow mix because they filmed that scene in chasing amy oh yeah at meow mix and guinevere turner was such an icon yeah for the we're we're the same age so like we have all the same like reference points and like when things closed down like it it was like we've had the exact exactly the same i guess like adolescents you know like gay gay adolescents totally um yeah, man. I mean, I loved Meow Mix. I mean, Caddyshack to me was just incredible. The three floors, the rooftop. Um, I also remember like there was a place on the in the West Village called like Bar Eighty Bar, bar Something that they would have um, maybe three nights a week were lesbian nights. Um, I, I I think I mean obviously I went out to a lot of other bars too, but the lesbian bars I frequented were probably I mean Gingers and in, in, in Brooklyn was also quite good at the time. Yeah. Caddyshack was the spot. Caddyshack because there was room. So mad it shut down. I'm still mad about that. Did you used to go to L Word like screening parties every like? Oh yeah, they did have that, didn't they? I did go. Starlight. You couldn't hear any starlight. Yeah, you couldn't hear though. So I'd get annoyed and I would like then watch at home and then go out. But um, but yeah, I forgot about those L Word screening parties. Everyone met. Everyone met their girlfriend. Add an L word screening. An L word screening is so good. At that time. So funny. Anybody who who dated between 2004 and like 2008, <laughs> they met at one of those parties. At one of those parties. <laughs> totally. Those are crazy. Yeah, those are really, those are good times in New York when they had so many options. And now it's like, it's just horrible. I mean, you got Cubbyhole, which is like half of your gay men. Like, great. And then, you know, Henrietta's uh, just still not, you know, Still not like the vibe I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. I mean, Ellis, the Ellis, the Ellis parties are, are kind of the closest thing I can find to what the Dalloway was or what Shack was. When you first came out to your, you said like your parents, like they weren't great, but um, like what, ha- what was years. the, what was the story? Um, God, I mean, I, I had a, a girlfriend at the time and I think we were out here. 
Um, and my parents didn't know. And I think my mom like saw us kiss or something and told my dad and my girlfriend was promptly sent home on the Hampton Jitney. Um, no. And then, uh, and then I, and then I told my parents that I was just experimenting. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know, I knew they were angry and I didn't want them to be. So I sort of lied about it. And then um, I, I guess I told them maybe six months or nine months later and you know, our relationship suffered for a few years, but now it's great. They got over it. Good. Very good. They seem to be the only, I think actually top model is what um, really helped because, you know, they were so worried about um, our family finding out and their friends. My dad worked at Goldman Sachs and he was all embarrassed by it, whatever. And um, when I was on the show, everybody around them, the rest of my family, my grandparents, like all of his, you know, coworkers, you know, everybody would just applauded me for coming out and being who I was. And I think my parents realized that they were like the only ones left off the memo that being gay was cool. You know, remember when gay was like being gay was like really cool. And now everyone's just gay. Yes. <laughs> now it's like boring. Now everyone's yeah. like, oh, cool. I'm like, no, but really. And they're like, no, we don't care. <laughs> so what did you what did you study at Wesleyan? Um, at Wesleyan, I studied foreign policy mostly. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, and like, what did you want to be? Uh, I always thought I'd like go work and, you know, for like a foreign policy think tank, work for the State Department or something. I was really, I was, I'm still obsessed with politics. I always have been. Um, I think I thought I'd be in politics, but. And how old were you? Like, were you a fan of Top Model? Like, how no, all of a sudden did you wind it, up on the it, show? It was, uh, I was writing my senior thesis, which was on the um, impact of exit strategies on U.S. intervention abroad in the post-Cold War era. Um, <laughs> so not really connected to modeling. Uh and I was... So wait, you had... Did you model as a kid or no. did you... Well, my mom was a big time model. So, you know, I was I was oh. in like a couple of shoots with her just like because they needed like a kid and I was cute. So, I mean... So you weren't a model. Oh, no. You were just like a college student. Zero interest in modeling, like less than zero. Um, didn't want to do it. I mean, I think my mom was amazing. Her career is incredible, but I, I just... It wasn't something I saw for my life. Um, What's your mom's name? Carol Brandt. Well, her name's Carol Brandt. So how all of a sudden do you how is top model piquing your interest because it, it wasn't i was um, on a break a study break with my friends and um we were flipping channels and this show came on none of us had ever heard of and we were watching and we were like this is ridiculous I mean, it was before reality tv was so big right i mean you had had the real world and then you had top model and there really wasn't anything else so i never i mean i watched a bit of the real world but this was the first like competition reality show i think that was kind of in existence i mean i guess there was um project runway was maybe before it i don't know no i think it was after I think Top Chef and Project Runway, they maybe had come like right around that same yeah, time. Yeah, it was all around the same time. It was the first one I had seen. And and so we were joking around and someone said, you know, one of us should totally try out for this show, like just for fun. And so we just basically, I was only two of us were above 5'7". And the, the show said you had to be above 5'7". And so I think we like flipped a coin, whatever. We did something silly and I ended up, um, there. someone looked it up and whoever lost the bet had to go try out as a joke. And um, there was an audition in Orange, Connecticut, which was like 30 minutes from Wesleyan or something on like next Tuesday. So we went and um, I went with a couple friends and, you know, I don't think I, there were, you know, out of the 40,000 girls that applied that season, I think probably, you know, 39,000 were probably better looking than me, but I, I got there and I, uh, and I definitely couldn't walk. All 40,000 were better at that than me. But I got there and, and I, I told my story. And the second I said I was gay, I think they were like, oh, she's in. <laughs> so, um, th yeah, they, they you, that right you, up. you stood out. Yeah, like that, you know, that was good. Yeah, it was good for the show. A diversity course. hire. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've always been a diversity hire. It's like my current job too. And I, and so, you know, they sent, I, I graduated college. Actually, I was supposed to start to filming Top Model, the semifinals, which was the first, which is the first episode. They do half semifinals. And um, two weeks before I graduated, and I called them. And I was like, well, I'm not, I can't come then. I'm not, I'm out of the show. No interest um, because I want to graduate from college <laughs> after all this. And so they pushed out the date for me. Um, and well, so, so wait, wait, go, go back a second. So what was the audition process like? Uh, so there were a couple. I, uh, they did the thing in Orange, Connecticut. And then two weeks later, I got a call and they had me come to New York to Macy's. <laughs> and I guess all the finalists, like maybe there were um, a thousand people left. Uh, and so a thousand of us lined up, um, waited like six hours and then did the next audition. And then I got a call a couple weeks after that saying, we'd like to fly you out to LA and, and, and do the show. But the actual auditions, was it a mix of like, was it interview style or were Both. they like seeing your look you, like, like did you have to like do photo shoots so they could see how you yeah looked? they did everything like it was kind of like a mini episode of top model you know you, you'd walk in 
they'd have you walk back and forth. They would uh, talk to you and ask you a million questions. Um, and then they would take some photos. But it was, I mean, look, in the end, they weren't really trying to find models. They were trying to find characters. So mm -hmm. that's what they found. <laughs> wow. And what did you look like at that time? So I had, um, so when I, was, when I got to college, I was being a bit of a rebel because my parents were so shit about me coming out. And so a bunch of my friends and I had like buzzed off our hair just like to, I don't know, rebel. Just wasn't really the look Wait, I was going like for. Ani DeFranco, like yeah, shaved yeah, head? Yeah, not shaved, but buzzed. And so we did that. And then I absolutely hated it and like missed my hair. Uh, so I let it grow back. But annoyingly, actually, it grew back brown. I used to have blonde hair before that. And it, after I buzzed my hair, it grew back it grew brown. I guess I shocked it or something. And so I actually was so happy because by the time senior year came around, my hair was finally back down to where I wanted it to be. And uh, the show, you know, they, they cut my hair. Hair. Oh more. no, we're gonna go deep about the hair cutting. <laughs> we will put a pin in that for a second. Your, but tell me about like your. So that's like what your your hair story. What was your your style? Like your style of dress? Um, yeah, I mean, like I guess Wesleyan's full of hipsters. I probably dressed a bit like a hipster, and um, we were all into like I don't know. Wesleyan is all about music and fashion in terms of the social scene. And I probably don't dress like I dress a lot more prep preppier now than I than I used to. And how do you find out? that you got it and you're going to be on the show they called me and they said we'd like to fly you out for the semifinals and i was like great when and they were like may 5th or something and i was like i graduated may 21st and they're like all right well then we're going to do it may 22nd so i graduated from college and at 5 a.m the next morning i was on a plane they filmed the whole thing in la yeah well no uh they did the whole you know they always take a trip at the end so we did the whole we did the yeah, first you went to london right yeah which was kind of funny because my parents um, lived in London at the time. So I thought, you know, with this trip, you know, they'd gone to like Thailand and like, you know, they'd gone to South America. Like they'd gone to all these cool places. And so I'm like, I made it to, you know, there are five people left and, or six people left. And I know that's when they do the trip. And I was like, shit, I made the trip. That's cool. I'm going to go somewhere cool. And they're like, you're going to London. And it was like, actually amazing. If you watch that episode, everyone's like, oh, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like so fucking mad. I'm like, I was just there like two weeks ago. I want and to go. What is your your friends, the ones who you, you know, like you flip this thing, you know, you flip the coin. It's like, they it just was couldn't a, believe it. This was a joke. Oh, it's a that total went joke. Way... But they know I'm like the most competitive person in the world. So as soon as I was in the competition, even if it wasn't something that I wanted for my life, I was like a thousand percent in trying to win. It's just, I can't be in a competition and not try to win. That's so funny. But um, yeah, it was really, it was crazy. I mean, my friends couldn't believe it. Um, Tyra Banks. Yes. What was your... Have you seen the recent news on her? What's the recent news? There was just, there was like all summer. There was, I, I somehow, I have a Google alert on myself just honestly for protection because I don't know what people are ever going to write. Um, and I haven't seen one, you know, come up since the Dalloway probably. And, uh, and all of a sudden I started seeing like emails. I'm like, what's going on here? I guess there was this big drama about Jay Manuel and, and Tyra Banks fighting because he said, you know, that she was really inappropriate on the show and she was like mean to certain girls and this would never fly now. And so my story came up constantly because when I was on the show and I was like, I'm gay, like I'm proud of who I am. Like I, I'm, you know, excited to express that. And Tyra told me like, I shouldn't, and she was like, well, I don't walk down the street, like, you know, announcing to everyone that I'm black. You really shouldn't celebrate the fact that you're gay so much. And like, at the time, I was like, okay. Um, but, and Jay Manuel talk, talked about that? And Yeah. So it came wow. up and they showed that clip everywhere. It was like oh. a huge, and I forgot, I, mean, I don't fucking remember that, but I watched and I was like, yeah, that was fucked up. <laughs> I don't remember that though. Tell me more stories. Just what was the interaction like with Ty? Like, did the contestants or did you ever socialize or like have any time with her outside no. of filming? Definitely not. Definitely not. I mean, I, I, I saw her, uh, they did one um, interview with her as one of the episodes. So I spent, I guess, that's long as I ever spoke with her. So maybe that was 10 minutes. Um, she did one photo shoot that she took the photos. That's that black and white one for mm -hmm. my season. So that was like another four minutes. Um, <laughs> so and then every we're calculating this in like minutes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, in the entirety of like the seven weeks that I filmed that, um, I probably spent an aggregate. If you take out the elimination, like if you take out like the parts that are you know the elimination part of the show um maybe i spent 30 minutes with her holy shit an aggregate wow yeah, well she wasn't part i mean why would she want to be like i don't know it's part of that um no it was you know she did her job that was it the other contestants were you mm -hmm. the only i mean i i mean because we're sitting here today 
I mean, you're the the one who every you were the celesbian that like broke out and like became like a celebrity to like. Well, the I was the three first out contestant on the show. Actually, what's interesting is that there were three three of the people in my season were gay, but they were told one of them didn't want the anyone. One of them didn't because of like their family and I don't think they are to the family. It didn't didn't want to like talk about it on the show, so that was just kept quiet. And the other one, you know, the, the producers kind of felt that they should have one, not three. <laughs> who were so, the other gay ones? Uh, Bree and Nick. Wait, they came like they were in the finals, right? Yeah, Bree got eliminated after they both got eliminated after me. Um, I think Nick was the final two, and then Nicole won. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Cool. You know, um, another contestant on your season, this chick Lisa D'Amato. Yeah, yeah, I'm still friends with Lisa. She's oh, you cra- are? She's crazy. I know, but um, I really like her. She went on to like All Stars or whatever. Yeah, that's she called. she's like a she's like addicted to being on reality TV a bit. I think. Mm. Um, she was also on Shark, that, like, Shark Tank. Yeah, but she was also on that like. What was that one where they took a bunch of reality TV? Was it, was it The Surreal Life or something? There was another show she was on. It was like kind really? of like past reality TV contestants all together from different shows. It was really strange. She, okay, this is why I bring her up. Coincidentally, she is married to my friend's brother. Oh, funny. In LA. Yeah, I've met him. Um, really? Yeah, I went, I went, when I was in LA, maybe five or six years ago, I went and hung out with her. her Adam. House. I don't remember his name, but yeah, I'm no. sure it's him. Um, <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I mean, we, we, she and I have kept in touch a bit over the years. I mean, she's she and I were quarantined together um, before quarantining was a thing. On top model, when you, know, you get eliminated, you have to quarantine for a bit until um, the season ends, basically, until they stop filming. So I don't know why, I guess, so that you don't run around telling people anything. But mm-hmm. um, they so they quarantine in twos. So she and I were quarantined in London together for, I guess, eight days. So they. Was- they do that on, I think, all competition yeah. reality, like they The do. Apprentice, Big Brother. It's yeah. it, there's a whole they thing. They always do it. Yeah. Let's go deep about the hair. Okay. Is is it a producer that's like, okay, we're so your hair was growing. Your hair was finally I was growing. Growing. Out. Um, yeah, my hair was growing. I must have actually buzzed it much later than freshman year because it was. Just, it wasn't growing. It was growing, but it wasn't that long yet. It must have. I was just so desperate for it to get back to its normal length. Uh, and then, of course. The gay girl has to have her hair cut on the show. I mean, and they dyed it red, which was just horrendous. But why did they feel that you had to cut your hair short? I don't know. I mean, because it's it was 2005. It was 15 years ago, and that was how they thought of it. They wanted me to like the whole show. I mean, to be honest, it was pretty offensive. I mean, I'm not like you know, I'm I I would have walked onto that show trying to wear what I thought I looked good in. I would have worn some dresses. I probably would have like you know worn like tight jeans and like a t-shirt and like. You know, they they like definitely put me in outfits that like try to make me like a tomboy like all the time. And I mean, fine, whatever for the show. But it was kind of like for someone who had come out, you know, a few years, be- a few years back. And for anyone at that age, I mean, you're still trying to figure out who you are in your late teens, early 20s. Um, just as a person not even about your sexuality but you don't you know you don't really know who you are and for someone to like force you into like you know a corner like that it was strange it wasn't great well not only were they sort of like stereotyping you into this kind of like boyish vibe yeah. but it's also like manipulating your identity a little bit yeah it is and it's also conflating gender and sexuality which should never be done I definitely took issue with that and I have more over the years as I've kind of grown to realize how fucked up that was did you like your hair short or was it just annoying? No, I hated it. I <laughs> hated it to like, I mean, I can't explain to you how much I hated it. It was just. But that look is uh, kind of iconic now. Like that's your iconic. I mean, that's what. I know. It's so brutal. I know. <laughs> that's how everyone remembers me. And then, you know, the blogs are like, oh, I miss her short hair, you know. So the show ends. And what did you do in the years? Like, did How soon after did you get the gig as a correspondent on MTV News? So, well, first I was at MTVU. I was running that, um, I was doing that music show, uh, new music videos. I ran that. I wrote that. I wrote that show and I hosted that show uh, for maybe six months. And then I wanted to be in news and I asked and they gave me the job in news. But I was, I mean, I, I top model finished airing in December of 05, maybe. Um, and I, or November of five, wait, wait, were you actually signed with a modeling agent? Did, did you become a model? You were, you yeah. were signed, right? Yeah. I mean, I was like at a bar or I was at the out 100. I don't know. I was at some like event and this guy, Jose Covarrubias, who was an agent at elite, uh, came up to me and said, Hey, I'd, I'd like to sign you and gave me his card. And I went in and met the elite team and I signed with elite and then he moved over to Ford and I went with him to Ford um, a couple of years later. And where, did, like, what was that experience? Like, what was that? I just that? didn't like modeling. Like, it's like, 
I'm someone who like I like to talk. I like to. Um, you know be social well, you're so and smart. it's a very lonely job it's, yeah. you know except for when you go out like you know when I went out to do Abercrombie and Fitch campaign like that was a blast right like that was so much fun but it was not generally like that right you kind of go from go see to casting to go see to casting all day long you, you, sometimes you get through your whole day and you've never even opened your mouth talk right like it's weird um I didn't like it and I wasn't very good at it either. So so for the MTV gig did you did they pick you because like did they approach you because you were unknown I was entity? looking for well I just figured like this has happened for a reason this top model thing like let me see where else I can take it I've got some kind of platform here I am really happy that I'm getting at that point I was getting messages and emails and letters like literally handwritten letters sometimes from people all across the country thanking me for being out and, be, and giving people strength to come out and no Kim, I just thought, Kim like, you were because you were like our peer you were like exactly our age meaning like my all of my friends yeah and us particularly you know particularly because you were a New York City kid and yeah. we were all like living in the city this is like in our early 20 like 25 yeah. 26 you were such a such like an icon because there were so few visible lesbians who were our age yeah who are our actual peers everyone of course there was like genesis on the real world and of course there were other people but they were much older yeah the fact that you were our generation like literally our age in our city Mm -hmm. like made you like totally accessible like you were one of us yeah totally still am um still am look you're right here with me now here i I am (laughs) um yeah i mean totally and and so I, i think i thought look I've got a platform now and I want to do something with it because why wouldn't I? Uh, So I actually, I I called um, a bunch of people I knew and one of the guys I knew who I'd met at a party a long time before was one of the heads of programming for MTV uh, and VH1. And I didn't, he, he didn't really have anything to do with the casting, but he said, well, let me introduce you to my friend Vinny. Um, Vinny does casting for MTVU and MTV News and, you know, why don't you just meet him? And he does castings all day long, so can't promise anything, but we'll see. And I went in and I did uh, a, basically like I like did a mock show with Vinny and um, his assistant, Christine, and I just never thought I'd get it. And I remember I was standing like in the meatpacking district in a shoe store. It was like January or t- February of 06. And I remember getting the call and then being like, we'd like to hire you. You know, you have your lawyer's details. I was like, what lawyer? Uh, we'd like, here we have a contract to send over. We'd like to hire you as our new VJ on MTVU. And I was like, what? Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a dream. It was like, I couldn't believe it. You know, someone growing up watching TRL, I couldn't believe that I was going to be on that channel. Of course, yeah. So that was, that was awesome. Like, I mean, those years at MTV were truly incredible. So you were, were you in the news department? Yeah. So I wrote, you know, I wrote for them and I, anchored and corresponded and all of that um so I first was MTVU and that was a year or maybe nine months and then I did both for a while and then I did Just News so were you working closely with like John Norris John Norris is still a friend of mine actually um I actually I haven't talked to him maybe a year but um John and I became quite close uh we hung out all the time as the two gay news anchors Mm -hmm. um uh, he was awesome, just like such a great guy. So it's such an icon. I mean, I knew John Norris. I mean, he was a total celebrity. And mm-hmm. then you know, he and I then were peers and just became close buddies. Uh, Gideon Yego as well. Um, he and I were, were, were friends for a bit. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anyone else. I mean, Kurt Loder, you know, he was mostly just doing movie stuff at that time. But, you know, his office was next to mine. It was cool. Amazing. Yeah. Where Carson Daly was long gone by that point. He was long gone, but I did do the final TRL where they brought a lot of people back and he came back for it. So I met him for that. But no, I didn't work with him. Your time at MTV, I mean, you must have had the opportunity to meet musicians and artists who you loved forever, yep. as well as have access and to sort of like kind of discover new talent. Yeah. Who were some of the people? So I want to hear both. Like, who were some of the people who you were like, Holy shit. I mean, listen, I know Melissa Farrick wasn't coming through the door. She, she wasn't. Uh, yeah. They didn't <laughs> but, want to interview her. But who were some of the people that were like, oh, my God, I can't believe I get to interview uh, XYZ? Well, my look, my number one musician, you know, I'm, I'm the biggest Fleetwood Mac fan. You know, Stevie Nicks is like yeah. far and away my favorite musician or Tom Petty, maybe. But so when I my last month at MTV, they said, all right, you've done well by us four years. Great job. Uh, name someone you want to interview and we'll do it for you. Um, and I named her and they got it. And I spent 45 minutes interviewing Stevie Nicks, which was like a life highlight. <laughs> Holy so incredible. shit. Um, I really, I mean, that was just amazing. And I asked her all about her relationship with Lindsay. I mean, I really, mm-hmm. I did a deep dive. Um, 
I, I loved it. Um, and that, that was one of my best experiences there. And unfortunately it was like my third to last day. I, I also have, I mean, my favorite story from MTV was when um, a girl no one ever heard of named Taylor Swift that was, was told, I was told I, I better, I'm, I'm going to be the, the news anchor or the correspondent covering the, the Taylor Swift album or whatever was coming. It was like the EP it just dropping. It hadn't even, it hadn't even dropped yet. And um, they brought her in. It was her first time in New York. And they said, can you just take her around and show her New York for us? And I was like, all right. So I like took her to like Barney's and I don't know. You took um, her to Barney? <laughs> yeah. I don't know why I did that. Um, but I, you know, we walked around um, Village or whatever we did. And then. Ooh, um, what was she like? A nice girl. She was a nice girl. I mean, she was fine. I don't know. She was like, like what nervous. Do you, what do you, she was nervous. Yeah. Uh, do you remember then, anything you talked about? No. I mean, like, where are you from? I mean, they were filming us the whole oh, time. Oh, they it was filmed like, it. Okay. Yeah, it was like a story. Like, oh, New Yorker Kim shows Taylor Swift the big city. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, and then um, we went, but we exchanged numbers. And like, you know, I, I think we might have hung out like once after that. But anyway, the what happened was that so that they brought us, then they brought me back uh, to MTV. She did a sh- uh, three songs for us in, in the studio. Um, and then we all talked about the music. And, and so they said, well, you, you know, I interviewed her. We did the whole thing. She went home or wherever she went, her hotel. And they were like, all right, well, Kim, you know, we all trust your opinion. Um, you know, what do you think? Like, what do you think this is? This girl's going to make it big. There's, a, you know, apparently quite a following behind her. And I was like, oh, I mean, nice girl, but she's not going anywhere. <laughs> I was like, I don't even think we should air it. So No, you said you didn't think they should air it. No, I was like, I don't even think this one matters. Because I did it all the time. Sometimes it, I was right, sometimes I was wrong. So I was wait, really wrong about that one. So wait, was it based on her personality or no, based on I was the just music? Like, I was just like, it's okay. I don't know. I just don't see anyone really liking this. I don't like it. I mean, I don't know. It's just yeah, so I'm bad. like so not a Taylor Swift fan. I just, I mean, it's, I get some of it, but like I never understood like the insane draw, but whatever. Um, That's funny. I think um, the nicest person I ever interviewed was, was Sarah Jessica Parker. Um, she was oh, wow. truly, I mean, I can't describe it. I, you know, I was a fan of hers too. And I went, I remember I interviewed her, spent 20 minutes during like the Sex and the City movie junket, um, when we all did press interviews for them. And I was there, at, I was then at the, um, was it the Oscars red carpet or the Grammys, right? It must have been the Grammys red carpet. And I was doing like MTV news interviews on the carpet and she was walking by and obviously she wasn't going to do the MTV one because she has much bigger and better things to do, but she caught, she saw me and she was Kim, right? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, you look beautiful. Wow. Like, it's great to see you. And she was like, I'm going to be over there with my friend Liv. It's like Liv Tyler or whoever else. And she was like, she's like, you should stop by and like say hi, you know? And I was like, what? Like, she just was like the nicest person ever. And like, just treated me like a total peer. Like, she was just great. Um, You know, most people were nice. There were very few that were, they stood out. The ones that were were not nice. Like, who is like the biggest dick you came across? Zach Raff. Really? Yeah. I'll never forget that one. What happened? Uh, he was a jerk. He, he came in and our lights were, I remember we were in one of our, it wasn't the main studio. It was one of our like side studios. Cause I think they were filming a TRL or something. And the lighting, uh, we couldn't get this one light to work. Um, and we needed it because it, the studio was quite a dark studio and it just wasn't going to look good. And he was like, he was like, oh, does Daddy Zach have to dip into his pocket for the MTV fund? You guys not doing so well? Like, he just made some jerk comment like that. And he was just rude the whole time, honestly. Um, just not a nice, not a nice guy. That's a good know. story, or Maybe he's having a bad day. I don't know. Maybe yeah. he's a great guy in general, but he wasn't nice that day. <laughs> I kind of love that. that story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just like, it just wasn't nice, though. The way he said it was quite condescending and. You know, I was like, by the way, like you're barely a celebrity, so take it easy. Yeah, like Garden State. Yeah, was like, like the, honestly, <laughs> couldn't have been worse. So let's take it easy. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, remember when Garden State was like Ugh. the. Do you biggest? remember the worst thing ever was that everyone, whatever that band was, that was that was always all over that sound. All the bands on that Cold, sound are, Coldplay. No, but it was the cold, it was one of the other ones that was less well known, and then everybody started listening to it. I'm like, you guys are all listening to it because you saw like you don't you're not like like you got that from a movie, by the way. Like it's not like you discovered this cool band. Like just stop. I know the band you're referring to. I don't even want to talk about it because it makes me angry. It's slipping my mind. I hope let, let it just continue to slip because it, it's. <laughs> I don't even want to talk about that band because they're just so annoying and they attract the worst people. Yes, I my my old MTV judgmental self is coming out. Um, but and so having now been on TV for quite a while, having like America's Next Top Model, which is like that's like a moment, but like a moment in time where it's like instant overnight fame. Then MTV, <laughs> which is like a growing like now you're on there for how many years were you on there? Four. That's a long time. Yeah, but nobody watched MTV by that point. <laughs> it wasn't exactly like. 
It wasn't what it was. Were people in New York recognizing you on yeah. the street? Mostly from Top Model. Still mostly from Top Model. But um, but yeah, I mean, I couldn't go the subway. I mean, it was crazy. I mean, there was a time period, probably like the three years after Top Model, it was... There were just some places I honestly couldn't go because you just get crowded. People go crazy. There are people that would come up to me and start crying. I mean, shit like that. And were they all like young lesbians? No. Um, the uh, No. Actually, it, it really wasn't. It was um, mostly women, a lot of gay men, some some gay, some straight women. I mean, it was, it was all over the place, actually. It really wasn't one group that was, you know, mostly into me. There, there was one funny story I remember. I, it was it was when the show was airing and the London part of the show was airing and I was I was actually working a law firm at the time um, and so it was like maybe November um, of 05 and I was on the subway going down to the law firm I was working at and some woman came up to me and she was like Kim and I was like yep you know like I knew she was like coming up and she was like girl wasn't you just in London last night <laughs> and I was like wow you think it's live Got it. Okay. So it's shit like that would happen all the time. People would be so strange. Um, but it was great. I mean, people were uh, generally really nice and, and really cool. Guys, at this point, I think we could all use a vacation. CheapCaribbean.com has been around for over 20 years and is in the business of providing the best all-inclusive beach vacations. An all-inclusive beach vacation means all-you-can-eat food, alcohol, and non-alcoholic beverages, as well as the beach and night activities, all included when you book at CheapCaribbean.com. Cheap Caribbean has no change fees when you book a Cheap Caribbean resort and allows you to add trip protection so you can book with confidence. Less money, less worry. So here's the deal. Right now, you can take $100 off your next Dreams or Secrets Resort when you book with CheapCaribbean.com slash Hot Takes Deep Dives. Be sure to include hyphens in between the words Hot Takes Deep Dives. So Hot-Takes-Deep-Dives. CheapCaribbean.com slash Hot-Takes-Deep-Dives. See you on the beach. So after the, the four or five years at MTV, did you start working corporate, like a corporate job? Um, I'll see. I wrote a book around that time. I wasn't sure I was going to do this. I applied to law school, um, got in, and then went to like a couple of like the kind of open houses and got to know. And I just realized it wasn't for me. I didn't want to do it. Um, and then I, I, I guess like my dad had always wanted me to join Wall Street, and I never really wanted to because – I don't know. I just kind of wanted to make my own way and not follow in his footsteps, um, even though he's awesome. I But I, I did think to myself, well, you know, markets, so I've always been kind of interested in that and current events. And I kind of like the camaraderie of it. So I went to visit a few friends um, who worked in, in at banks. Um, and then one of them, um, I didn't want to join a big bank at that age because like I'd be coming in like five years later than everybody else. Um, I did find a smaller shop and, and just liked it. And I just kind of fell in love with the place. It was very different than all the big banks. And um, I asked the guy if I could work there for free for a while until I proved that I deserve a job. And he said yes. And so that's how it all started. Wow. And how far into working at the bank did you and Amanda open the Dalloway? Uh, I guess I'd been at that shop for two years and I was at Citigroup. I guess it was maybe three years in. And how did you... Okay, so this is Amanda Lee, Lee, Dunn. Lee Dunn, who... Was on The Real L Word. Well, not only was she on The Real L Word. Oh. She was on, there was a show called High Society. Oh my God, I had no idea. With, it was Tinsley Mortimer's first reality show. I do show. remember Tinsley Mortimer in that show. I didn't know Amanda was on it. Amanda is like in the background and like has a few speaking parts. <laughs> really? Because, yes, because, oh, yes, because I did a deep dive on High Society like over uh. the winter. <laughs> all on YouTube. Oh my God. And um, so it's very interesting to watch like Tinsley's, like f she's freshly, separated from topper yep her husband yep and it's basically just all these like socialites in yeah in new york totally. city and there's a guy a gay guy i want to say his name is jp she was friends with him mm -hmm. and she would occasion and i was like this amanda lee dunn has been courting reality fame yeah for longer than I even yeah, she thought. She loved it. She loved it. She ate that stuff right up. She 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 wanted, whereas I kind of thought it was all a big kind of joke and just had fun with it. I mean, she loved it. She, you know, she'd love to be on more shows, I think. How did you know her? Uh, I met her at, um, at, at that, oh God, that was a great lesbian party on Sundays uh, at the, at, at a, oh. Oh, at the Maritime Hotel? Yeah. What was that called? That great party. Um, it was such a great lesbian party. Um, God, every Sunday 
daytime party. Yes. Fuck, um, I can't remember. It'll come to me at some point. That was a great party. So that's where you met her. Yeah. And she said, I have a thing. I was sitting next to my friend, Sarah, who uh, I was actually my client. And um, she didn't want to be in the public eye about the restaurant, but she was our selling partner. Um, oh. So she lost the most money of everyone. <laughs> uh, we all lost a little, but she lost a lot. So Amanda came up to me and we were talking. And um, Did you know, did you recognize Amanda from The Real L Word? I, I don't remember. I don't, I didn't really watch that show. Um, I watched like a couple of episodes and like couldn't take it anymore. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I guess I might have. I might have recognized her. I think I remember thinking, I think at the time I thought her um, friend Lauren was hot. So but, yes, she um, and Lauren were like a dynamic duo. Yeah, yeah. And I'm also, we're, we're friends with Kiyomi and her wife. So mm-hmm. I know Kiyomi from, from that time, that yeah. time period too. But yeah, Amanda um, just came up to me and we were talking about how great the um, party was and how we should have more lesbian bars. And we're like, well, let's just do it. So we did it. So it's you strange. didn't have like a long friendship before nope. you went into business together? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> knew nothing about her oh that's so, i didn't that's so surprising to me i figured you were like friends from new york city no i didn't never met her before so what was the thought process going into so you guys stiletto stiletto <laughs> yes stiletto that was a great party. how did you just what a horrible name for it by the way but just but like great popped part, in your it head just popped in my head remember the remember there was starlight on like avenue a yep and in the yeah. original l word bet Remember when she was like broken up with Tina? <laughs> yeah. She go. They filmed her. Literally, they came. They went on location to New that. York. They filmed her going. When she through. was like losing her mind. Yes. <laughs> and she like brings that girl. Back. Oh yeah, she brings that random girl back. Yeah. God, her and that carpenter story. Yeah, Remember that was that? horrible. Yeah, but that was kind of hot. The jail scene. Yeah. See, that's like not for me. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> We had to bring the carpenter into this. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so I know. I, I don't know. Carmen was my, like, I loved Carmen. Did you watch the new, the the Generation Q, the one that came out last we, year? Uh, we we tried. We just tried. couldn't get into it. Well, we, I think we watched four episodes or something. Just didn't get into it. I probably should finish it. But it, As it went on, it got, it got better. Did it? By the end, it was like, I was actually invested in some of these people. Yeah? Okay. All right. Well, maybe we'll get another shot. I, I mean, yeah. I, I, there are, there are like, I, I like parts of that show. Um, I just, yeah, we just didn't get into it. Like, did you ever get like an email or anything from like Kate Menig or Alicia Haley? Were any of them sort of like, oh, like, we're into Kim. Like, we should. I think they were like, a, if I was like a, an, an FGH list celebrity. They're A. They, they were like C. But they're no. certainly above oh, me. Oh, I, I was referring to like in the celesbian Oh, in the world. celesbian world, they were A and I was like D, right? But in the real world, they were like C and I was like K. <laughs> so um, they were a little bit out of my league. Um, okay, so the Dalloway. What was your vision for the space and how did you decide on that specific location, which that location is cursed? So no, I'll tell you what the problem is. That's when Broom splits into two streets and nobody walks down that street. Literally, there is zero foot traffic on that street. So you can't survive as a restaurant or a, or a um, bar there. You just can't. A lot of places have come and gone yeah, in that there's no foot traffic. location. We were too stupid. We were so impulsive. The whole thing was so impulsive. I don't even know Amanda. Let's open a bar with her. Oh, this chef, she seems, she's a lesbian. She seems nice. Let's hire her. She had no fucking idea what she was doing. Like, um, none of us knew what we were doing. Literally no idea. We spent so much money on the dumbest stuff. The only thing we did was design that place well and the rest of it, the business side, was a disaster. We only hired lesbians. They all started sleeping with each other. They got in fights. They caused problems with service. I literally had this one girl who will remain nameless that slept with the entire staff. And I was like, and their staff was fighting over and one people were quitting and they were just getting mad. And, and I was like, you have to stop sleeping it sounds like, with the staff. It, it sounds, I mean, she was very hot. It sounds like Vanderpump Rules. Yeah, basically. It was just... Oh, yeah man, it was crazy it was crazy you could have done a show set there should have yeah 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 honestly yeah my job wouldn't have allowed that but it would have been a nice idea if i stayed out of it yeah it and fun. how did you i mean was it just a total bummer that you guys had to close i mean it wasn't it wasn't it was a relief in some ways because it was so much work I and mean, i was you know i was working in finance getting to work at seven leaving at five going straight to dalloway there till not till close because close is 4 a.m but i was there till 2 a.m a lot of time going home waking back up like it was that for a year and a half two years and it just became too much for me um and we weren't making enough money to make it worth my time really um and i would have loved to keep it open i really really i mean i miss it it was great it was a great bar but um it it was a lot of work and and there was a lot of drama 
and there's a lot of infighting. It just became too much. Yeah, Vanderpump Rules. Yeah, totally. Basically. Would you ever do another gay bar? Yeah. Maybe I without mean, the restaurant component that would make yeah, it really Yeah, I mean, we'll expensive. be tied up in the mortgage of this house for a long time, so I don't think we'll be opening any um, any bars uh, anytime soon. But look, in the future, absolutely. I would love to. I would definitely only do a bar, not a restaurant. Yeah. But yeah, at some point I'd like to. And where are you working? You're still in finance. Yep. What? So like, what do you do now? So I work at Bank of America. I spent most of my career in equity derivatives, a uh, small stint in prime brokerage. And now I'm a senior relationship manager. So I kind of talk to the top of the or- of, of the organizations at um, hedge funds, asset managers, insurance, and Damn. Kinda, you know, just talk about business. Wow. And you're married. Yep. Did you just get married? We did. Oh yeah. my God. And so how did you meet and how long have you been together? Uh, so we met at work and we've been together a year and a half. Wait, how long were you together before you got married? Like a year and a half. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know. A year and four months or something. Wow. And yeah. what does your wife do? She works at uh, Bank of America as well in prime brokerage. In in what? In prime brokerage. Prime brokerage. Yeah. Okay, I have no it's idea. So what boring. I don't even. Means. What we do is too boring to even waste your time on. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> Would you ever like? Do you have any aspirations to like be in the the public eye again? Like, if you were approached, suppose you were approached for some version of a reality show or something like to open up like another business or to like mentor people like it is depends that- what it was for i would absolutely go and be a news correspondent again i mean that's like i wish i could do that i would you know do that today if i could um i would not do another reality television show just because i don't really see the value in that and i, I mean you know if it was about opening a business I'm like, maybe but it would have to be something that's substantive i just i've passed the point of wanting to you know just be on it to be on it are you still friends with amanda like did the friendship we we the friendship dissolved for a bit and then it we actually i guess it was pride last year we started talking a bit more and we thought we'd do a dalloway pop-up and then COVID happened oh you were gonna do a dalloway pop-up yeah we probably still will at some point but obviously not right now so what was the pop-up gonna like you would just open it for like pride month or pride we do week? like we would find us we were gonna find a cool space and just uh do a big dalloway party get the staff back get the people back and Aww, do something fun that's fun well you should do when everything opens up again yeah, that would love be really to. people do something out girls would freak they, they would need to love be more it. lesbian like bars and um parties in the hamptons like there's none out here yeah i don't know what's going on out here it's as far crazy. as as far as like except that. for this street as far <laughs> Yeah, tell me the street I live on. Tell tell the story. Tell tell them what you told me. So my wife and I just bought this house. And uh, so basically, the house has a guest house where our friends Erica and Mara, who are also gay, um, and a couple, they will be renting that from us. And then we found out that the house next door, which is a similar looking house, um, but also has a barn and and some other um, things on the property, is owned by two really very wealthy amazing lesbians um so they and they have house guests that come they're also lesbian couples so it, we're not technically in sag harbor but you know they call sag harbor fag harbor yeah you know also sag harbor um had a lesbian night a long time ago um but that was years and years ago that was 10 or 15 years ago but i haven't seen anything since almond in bridgehampton on friday nights is a gay night but it's gay men any final thoughts you have a very impressive story i mean you've kind it's of been like, a strange ride <laughs> yeah like it's been an interesting ride it's and eclectic. you're still very young you're still like in your mid-30s like mm-hmm. it's in you've had success in all these different areas of the yeah. entertainment industry but also in actual like corporate america where you can it, like you can leverage that however maybe it'll allow you to open up a bar again well that's the thing city. i mean the thing i the thing i like about working in finance and you know there are a lot of things i don't like but the, the thing i really do like about it is it's truly a meritocracy the bank doesn't care who you are what you look like you know who you date all they care is that you perform well and bring money in for the firm so to me it's one of the best places to work as a gay person and they really care about diversity so it almost gives you a leg up um the other thing about it is that you know, at the end of the day, it enables you to live your life the way you want to outside of work and mm-hmm. enables you to, you know, be able to fight for what you believe in and put money where your mouth is. Right. And I think that has been important to me. Um, and I, I don't like to be told no, I don't like to not be able to do what I want. So, um, you know, while being in finance has its, you know, it has its issues. Um, and there are some, there's some issues that I have with it, but 
I mean, it does enable me to live the life that I want to live. Yeah, you've said that being gay has only helped only your helped. career. Yeah, for sure. It's only helped. I mean, look, I think being out and being, you know, your clients, for instance, I mean, people find me more interesting than they find like the straight white guy that covers them, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, you have more to talk about, a better story. You know, the guys like, you know, guys on the desk are happy to talk to me about girls that they're pursuing or like stuff they're going, you know, that like that. And I also, and then I can equally relate to the women on the desk because we're women, right? So um, I, I, I've only found it to be a huge help in my career and my life. Yeah. You're wonderful. How can, you know, if people want to reach out to you, how can people get in touch with you? I mean, like, are you on Instagram? I'm on Twitter? Instagram. I'm at Kimmy Stoltz on, on Instagram. It's probably, probably Instagram is probably the best way. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. Cool. Thank you for doing this. Guys, uh, you can follow me, Jess XNYC. Be sure to follow the show account, Hot Takes Deep Dives. And thank you, Kim. Yeah, thank you. Love it's it. Good to have you.